We're going? Yes, go. All right, folks. We'll try this again. I need to wrap up a little by talking about prohibition before we talk about the ladies' blues singers of the 1920s. You'll recall I was talking about the reasons why jazz became popular, ubiquitous in the 1920s. And I suggested there were reasons tied to the cultural impact of World War I and the crisis it set off regarding civilization, white civilization, and the failures of civilization. Then I talked about the great migration of African Americans outside of the South to northern cities, which sort of propagated, disseminated, expanded the audience for jazz. And then I was talking about the kind of modernist currents, the reason why Americans were interested in a music that emphasized passion, spontaneity, improvisation, etc. And the last thing I need to touch on is prohibition. And the reason why prohibition is important is because prohibition worked to cement the connection between jazz and kind of edgy urban life in very practical, very tangible ways. And we can see that borne out if we look at this map of Chicago up here on the screen. I'll use the mouse here to emphasize this. These are the African-American neighborhoods that emerged as a result of the Great Migration. This is to the west of the stockyards of Chicago when Chicago was the meatpacking capital of the United States. And this is also to the south side of Chicago. Stockyards were here, so African-Americans lived to the south and to the west of the stockyards. Well, during Prohibition, as a result of the, uh, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibited the distribution and manufacture of alcohol in the United States, and for all practical purposes, the consumption of alcohol, uh, a huge illicit trade in alcohol developed, as we all know, and you get the gangs of Al Capone, etc., that were bringing in alcohol from Canada and Europe, as well as manufacturing illicit alcohol. All right, that illicit trade was pushed into often ethnic neighborhoods and African American neighborhoods by the politicians who ran American cities. And the reason why is very simple. Most cities in the United States had opposed prohibition. So from 1920 to 1933, when prohibition existed, city dwellers were not in favor of prohibition and indeed violated prohibition to the extent that they could by consuming illicit alcohol at speakeasies and other illegal clubs. Politicians in America's cities tended to be sympathetic, if not outright in, uh, opposed, I should say sympathetic to their constituents who wanted to continue to drink alcohol. Moreover, there was a lot of money to be made for politicians who were bribed by gangland, gang leaders, etc. So what politicians, urban politicians did was they drove the illicit alcohol trade into African-American and ethnic neighborhoods keeping it out of white neighborhoods, white middle-class neighborhoods, because it was my white middle-class voters who were most likely to either support prohibition or to be hostile to the illegal alcohol trade, even though middle-class whites themselves may have consumed illegal alcohol. So all of this is to say that as the illegal alcohol trade was pushed into African-American communities, it meant that whites pursuing alcohol into black neighborhoods came into contact with black cultural life that they might never have otherwise experienced. So during the 1920s, during the era of prohibition, the phenomenon of whites slumming, going into African-American neighborhoods, seeking out nightlife, speakeasies, became commonplace. One example of this is, I'm going to move past this lovely photograph. I'll come back to that in a moment. And also that picture. One example of this is the Cotton Club in Harlem, the most famous of all of these clubs of the Prohibition era. It was a club actually 
owned and operated by a gangster, but this club where African American bands, Fletcher Henderson's orchestra, later Duke Ellington's orchestra, Louis Armstrong would play there, where African American artists performed for, as you can see, very well attired whites who traveled up to Harlem to get illegal alcohol and to enjoy African American nightlife. And when they went there, what they were exposed to was, of course, jazz. So jazz became the music of speakeasies, the music of the jazz age, of prohibition alcohol, and the relationship then between a kind of criminal underworld, urban culture, and jazz became synonymous in the eyes of most Americans. And so, as a result of prohibition, whites who might otherwise never have had, never had, may never have sought out African American nightclubs, African American cultural venues like speakeasies, bars, uh, nightclubs, found themselves in African American parts of town and were exposed along with African American culture to jazz. So in this manner, as I've been emphasizing, jazz became woven into not only this edgy side of urban life, but woven into the idea of the music of modern urban America. And it stood in contrast to other forms of music that we've talked about, particularly hillbilly music, that were associated with more traditional America. So prohibition was another contributing factor to the dissemination of jazz as well as the image that jazz would acquire in the American imagination. So we're going to move on now to a genre of music which is as much a, an expression of this urban modern culture, modernist culture, as jazz was. And it may be surprising to you that the blues an African-American form of music that we often associate with the rural South, especially the Mississippi Delta. What may be surprising to you that the blues was a vehicle for this modernist cultural descent as well. So I'm going to click over to the next Prezi, and we're going to start off by listening to a song by Ma Rainey. And of course, I'll ask you, and I'll encourage you to listen to this song on the Prezi yourself. But let me pull it up. There we go. So, as I said, we're going to listen to this song by Ma Rainey. Eventually, once it allows us to do so. Here are the lyrics. And here's an advertisement to the song we're going to hear. It's called Prove It On Me Blues. Maybe we'll hear it. 
of that song, and I do encourage you to listen to it again, read the lyrics carefully. It may be odd to you that I'm suggesting this song somehow is part of this modernist revolt. The song, the, the instruments used in the song are banjo, a jug blowing across the mouth of a jug like an old jug band, a kazoo. It sounds really old style, traditional, rural, and yet I'm claiming that this song somehow is about ignoring ideas of respectability and notions of high culture. Well, that's where I think if you look at the lyrics, you'll see that this is a song about something that you may not have imagined that Ma Rainey or another African-American woman of the 1920s would be singing about. So, how is it that I'm going to make this argument? Well, first off, I want to emphasize that the blues that we associate with the 1920s or the blues of the 1920s that were popular during the 1920s are very different than the Mississippi Delta blues that you may be familiar with. That is the type of blues sung by a single black male playing a guitar. The biggest blues stars of the 1920s were African American women. And these are African American women who are singing about men who have done them wrong or their insatiable appetite for the good life for tireless lovers and for fast living. So I'm not going to linger much, if at all, on the blues musical form. You may associate the blues with a specific sound, a specific rhythm or song themes, a specific tempo. Often we think of the blues as being slow. In fact, the blues can be fast or slow. They can be very sad or they can be very joyous. The blues are defined by a particular chord progression, a particular set of chords, and a musical scale. We don't have to linger on that for our purposes. I may touch on it later in a few lectures. But for our purpose today, what's important is that the blues was a very flexible genre of music. And these women blues singers of the 1920s took full advantage of that flexibility. Now, I want to linger on the fact that we're talking about women blues singers during the 1920s. Most of the women singers I'll be talking about are African American for reasons that will become clear. But the 1920s marked a period when women singers in general acquired a new prominence. So this new prominence speaks to the ways in which women were redefining their life choices during the 1920s. So this is going to be a history where we talk about women using music to try to voice frustration with some of the constraints that shaped their lives, using music to talk about ways to escape those constraints. But we're also going to see that this music couldn't free women from all of these constraints. So, women singers, women performers in the 1920s. So far in this course, we haven't talked about women as performers for the most part. That's not to say that women hadn't been performers prior to the 1920s. But as you would imagine, those ideas that we've talked about, about culture and civilization, and the role of women as nurturers of culture, placed real restraints on the types of careers that women could pursue. So just as women weren't supposed to be involved in politics, in fact, until 1920, women couldn't vote, so they couldn't practically be involved in politics, so too women were, of course, assumed to avoid certain careers because if they participated in them, they would bring themselves into disrepute. So notions of feminine respectability circumscribed the careers open to women so that women might perform on stage, but if they performed on stage, they risk being perceived as being loose. And it also meant that if they did perform on stage, they had to be very careful about the type of subjects 
they sang about. Moreover, with few exceptions, women were confined to complimenting male performers. So women might be on stage, but they are always secondary to men. Now, we know that women were major consumers of music. We've already talked about that. We've talked about how Stephen Foster had an understanding that women were part of his audience, and so he wrote songs that appealed to both men and women. So there was the notion of women as cultural and moral guardians, and in that role of guardians of the morality of the home, women could be consumers. But the presumption was that women would buy music, would consume music that had a high moral tone, and that it was music that would somehow advance the project of refined culture. What we're going to see during the 1920s is not only were women performers willing to perform music that violated these ideas about feminine culture and taste, but women consumers were also willing to violate their presumed role as custodians of morality in the household. So there's no precedent for the place that women would take for themselves in the music industry during the 1920s. They became not only prominent consumers of modern music, but they also elbowed their way onto the stage as major performers. And so it's in this context we're going to focus especially on African American women who enjoyed unprecedented success on the stage, on records, even during a time of pervasive segregation and racism. So, let's start first with why these African American women were recorded during the 1920s. Just as record executives had been late to start recruiting hillbilly musicians because they assumed white Southerners were too poor, too uncultured to want to buy records, so too white record executives had assumed that African Americans were not going to be a valuable market for recordings. And they doubted, of course, that whites were going to buy music recorded by African Americans to begin with. So prior to 1920, there were few recordings of African Americans. But after World War I, in the late teens, in early 1920s, a combination of new record executives, much cheaper recording technology, and new marketing campaigns demonstrated that there was a market for black records. I should say a market in the African American community for black records and a market in the white community for black recordings. First, let's talk about the market. There were black merchandisers, that is store owners, black newspapermen, black publicists, who were eager to snag advertising dollars by advertising records for African Americans. And the black merchandisers, of course, wanted to sell the records and make their profit that way. So black merchandisers and newspapermen organized buying campaigns for blacks. The Chicago Defender, one of the most widely read black newspapers of the era, a black newspaper that was not only sold widely in Chicago, but also throughout the entire United States. Well, the Chicago Defender began urging African Americans to buy records by black recording artists as part of race pride. One of the early examples of this was this song, Crazy Blues, recorded by Mamie Smith in 1920. Crazy Blues sold 70,000 copies during its first month of release. These were huge numbers in those days. And it sold more than a million copies in less than a year. So here was compelling evidence to record executives that there was a market for black artists 
and black records. At the same time, there were these new record executives. And there, what happened is very simple. For a variety of reasons, one tied to the fact that recording technology had been around, the early recording technology had been around long enough that it had become cheaper. Masses, mass scale of reproduction, etc. But in addition to that, many of the copyrights, many of the patents that had restricted the technology to the original creators of the technology were now passing so that it was possible for new companies to enter into recording technology using these lapsed pat patents, etc. In any case, what is, is to say that taking advantage of the much reduced cost of entering the recording business, there are a whole host of new record companies that emerged in the early 1920s. And these record companies took advantage of not only the low cost of entry into the business of recording music, but also the drop in the cost of manufacturing records. So by the early 1920s, it was possible to recoup the cost of recording a record if you could sell 5,000 copies. So if you could sell 10,000 copies, you made a profit. If you could sell 50,000, you made very substantial profits. Anything above that, you were minting money. So when Mamie Smith came along, and she sold 70,000 copies in a single month, and a million copies in a year, there was money to be made in race records. And so record companies began rushing out to sign up African-American artists. In other words, to try to find the next artist who is going to record another song like Crazy Blues. And so it was Bessie Smith. Oh, I should just describe this image. These are examples of advertisements for African-American records. And you can see they were described as Negro records. They were sometimes described as race records but they were clearly marketed as the product of African Americans. This way, anybody who bought the records would know that it was an African American artist. If you were a white who was going to be offended, you would steer clear of these. But for many whites, the idea that it was a race record was attractive, especially after the success of Mamie Smith. So here's who I want to get to, Bessie Smith. This is Bessie Smith, not Mamie Smith. Bessie Smith was the most gifted and certainly the most popular of all the women blues singers of the 1920s. And she's the one who demonstrated the full potential of the blues for women singers in the 1920s. In 1923, so three years after Mamie Smith recorded Crazy Blues, Bessie Smith recorded Downhearted Blues for Columbia Records. Her record sold 800,000 copies in six months and more than two million copies by the end of the first year. She went on to record 159 other songs for Columbia and her sales toted nearly seven million copies by the end of the 1920s. She was largely responsible for keeping Columbia records afloat during the 1920s Columbia, as you'll see over the course of the semester, one of the great record labels in the United States, has perennially had business problems. It's hard to explain why, but in any case, Bessie Smith was one of the most important recording artists for her label. So how do we explain the popularity of Bessie Smith during the 1920s? How was it that she was able to attract these millions and millions of listeners now part of it was she was attracting a large African-American audience. We know that African-Americans were disproportionate consumers of records. Contemporary record sales salesmen acknowledged that African-Americans bought records in greater numbers per capita than many whites. Part of the reason for this may be that during the 1920s, radio, a technology we haven't talked about yet, but we will, radio became more and more common, more and more accessible as the 
cost of radio uh, equipment declined and as more and more radio stations were opened in the United States. So as the 20s went on, more and more white Americans bought radios and listened to radio because radio offered music for free and radio stations broadcast a lot of white performers. But radio did not perform many black performers, did not allow many black performers to be on radio until the late 30s and especially the 40s. So during the 1920s, African American consumers who wanted the latest music had to buy either sheet music and or records if they were going to hear it. So presumably that's one explanation of why African Americans rushed out to buy the music of Bessie Smith. They couldn't hear it on the radio. But the success of Bessie Smith, Mamie Smith, of Crazy Blues, Ma Rainey, the first song we heard, and Ethel Waters will hear in a moment, cannot be solely explained by African Americans' willingness to spend their money on records. Black consumers made choices. There was other music they could have bought. What was it about what Bessie Smith was singing about? What was it that the women blues singers were singing about that made them so popular? What was it that made consumers want to buy songs that defied traditional notions of propriety? So it's not just race pride on the part of African Americans that can explain why black consumers were buying Bessie Smith's records. And then we have to consider why white consumers were buying these records. What was it that Bessie Smith was singing about that whites wanted to hear? And I think a key to understanding this, ah, I keep doing this. Here are some of the African American blues singers I was talking about. There's Ethel Waters, who we're going to hear in a moment, and that's Ma Rainey up there in the top. So, what was it that explains this? I think a key is the relationship between these women singers and the emerging youth culture of the 1920s. The relationship between these black women blues singers and this revolt against traditional morality and traditional culture that we've already talked about with regards to, for example, jazz. So from the 21st century vantage point, we may look at these flappers here dancing to Charleston in their fur coats. We may look upon them as kind of silly, frivolous, you know, one-time cultural rebels that in their teen years, their early 20s, are engaged in rebellion, but then they would marry and go back into their conventional roles as wives or mothers. But I want to underscore that I think it's a serious mistake if we view these women and the revolt they were involved in as nothing more than just an ephemeral, a passing fad. These women were drawing their cues from the lifestyle of those working class women we talked about who played such an important role in popularizing social dance in the 19 teens. So these were women who flirted with re Bohemian rebellion and sexual freedom. They threw away their corsets. They wore short dresses. These are short by comparison to the dresses that women would have worn just 20 years before. They bobbed their hair. You notice, well, it's somewhat hard to see in these images, but their hair is much shorter than the very long hair that was commonplace in the late 19th century. They smoked cigarettes. They drank prohibition alcohol. They bound their chests in a distinctly flat-chested silhouette. In other words, they were creating the rudiments of 20th century female youth culture. And here's this extraordinary image of the flapper from Life magazine that's emphasizing a, not only is it displaying her body in a way that would never have been done previously, but it's emphasizing her with her arms open, sort of exposing herself literally and figuratively to the eyes of a spectator, something that in the culture of the 19th century, especially 19th century femininity, this would have been seen as completely unacceptable. Young women 
needed only to listen to records to be coached in how to violate or revolt propriety. I'm going to use two stars. Actually, I'm going to use one star in particular, Marion Harris. This is Marion Harris down here. This is Sophie Tucker, who I'm not going to mention in detail, but Sophie Tucker, like Marion Harris, sang songs that had addressed some of these same themes. So Marion Harris was a hugely popular white singer who recorded songs like I'm a Jazz Vampire. In I'm a Jazz Vampire, she gloated over her wickedness and her ability to ma manipulate men. And it made it clear that part of her manipulation was through, shall we say, sexual magnetism. In Sweet Papa, or Sweet Daddy, your mama's getting mad, she warns her man that she's armed with a razor, and if he doesn't treat her right, he's risking a trip to the undertaker. Again, in the, in the 19th century, women weren't singing songs about slicing their, uh, their man's juggler vein. In I'm going to do it if I like, Marion Harris adopts the persona of a 17-year-old girl who's arguing with her mother. The girl is obviously running wild, and she's dismissing her mother's stern advice by repeating the chorus of the song. I'm going to do it if I like it. And as, if you look at the lyrics, you'll see that what she wants to do if she likes it uh, is far outside the bounds of propriety. But if Marion Harris gives us some hint of how these songs cross the line of propriety, it was female race record vocalists, African-American women, who made the cleanest break from traditional morality. Now, why black women blues singers went furthest isn't clear. One possible explanation may be that white record executives assumed that black audiences would be less upset by black women blues singers who crossed the lines and went far into inappropriate subjects and inappropriate behavior. And so they could release recordings that violated prevailing codes of propriety without any backlash. But it could also be that African-American blues singers were singing about themes that had particular importance to African-Americans. And so the records reflect concerns within the African-American community as much as the racist attitudes of white record executives. Whether sung by men or women, the blues explored the ways in which African-Americans were making taking advantage of the opportunities that they had, especially the opportunities in the urban north, or I should say in the urban United States. So there's a lot of emphasis on freedom of travel, the right to move around and choose where you're going to live. Another important theme is personal independence. And that makes a lot of sense at a time of the Great Migration when literally hundreds of thousands of African Americans were moving across the United States looking for better opportunities. And so, for African Americans who were seeking opportunities for education, material wealth, or just plain old to act out by themselves, emphasis on mobility and independence makes sense. And then, of course, sex was a ubiquitous topic. And here we can see that kind of modernist culture where instead of sex being repressed as a kind of animalistic impulse, sex is not only acknowledged, but elevated and embraced. But black women singers had more specific things to sing about. So Bessie Smith and her contemporaries recognized that when they sang about migration from the rural South and the confinements of family life, traditional family life, and they contrasted it with the fast-paced living in urban settings, they were talking about a lifestyle 
that many in their audience aspired to, even if they themselves couldn't enjoy it. So black women singers were singing about enjoying their freedom from the straitjacket of traditional inherited gender roles. These were songs that were often unambiguous celebrations of female autonomy, including sexual autonomy. So you may be asking, okay, how unambiguous? I mean, I'm claiming this, but what's the evidence for this? Let me play a couple songs for you. The first I'm going to play is Empty Bed Blues. This is a song by Bessie Smith where she makes it very clear what are the talents that she values in her man. You can see the lyrics above the song. Let me get it to play here, I hope. Every time I have to do this, I don't know why. If I shrink it down, and I can go over here and make it play. you get the idea, by all means listen to the rest of the song, pay attention to the lyrics. Next I want to move on to organ grinder blues. You're going to see there's a, a coffee grinder, organ grinder. I think you can see the connection here. This is Ethel Waters from Organ Grinder Blues singing about a similar set of concerns. Oops. No, sorry about that. Wrong one. I thought that was... Uh, technology is always a pain. Ah. Darn it. No. Get this 
you get the idea there. So again, as I've suggested, this is not very ambiguous. Uh, it's pretty straightforward what Bessie Smith and Ethel Waters are looking for in a man. They, so in addition to singing openly about women's sexual desire, they also sang openly about, for example, male infidelity. The protagonists of Women Blues threaten their men with violence if they threaten to if they either abandon them or else are untrue. In Sing Sing Blues, for example, Bessie Smith sings from behind prison bars. And she's acknowledging that she killed her man for his infidelity. But she doesn't express any remorse in the song. She closes by singing, quote, I killed my man and I don't need no bail. Again, these are not subjects that would have been part of conventional late 19th, early 20th century parlor music. So blues women celebrated the right to conduct themselves as expansively and as selfishly as men. In Ma Rainey's song, Barrel House Blues, for example, she sings, quote, Papa likes his bourbon, Mama likes her gin, Papa likes his outside women, Mama likes her outside men. What's good enough for Papa's, good enough for Ma Rainey. And Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey also offered unflinching portraits of psychological and physical abuse that could distort dysfunctional relationships. And again, these are subjects that would never have been part of late 19th century popular music. And let me use the example. I'll just put the lyrics up here for this song. This is Taint Nobody's Business If I Do, which is a song that Bessie Smith sang. Let me get it fully up there. There we go. And... In this song, as you'll see, Bessie Smith is singing about a very dysfunctional relationship with her man. It's one of which she gives him all the money she has, he doesn't treat her well, and indeed he seems to abuse her. And in fact, she acknowledges that he physically abuses her. If you notice, she says, I'd rather my man would hit me than to jump up right and quit me. Taint nobody's business as I do. I swear I won't call no copper if I'm beat by my papa. So this is a very dark song about a woman who's in a deeply problematic relationship, an abusive relationship, and yet she is singing, it's nobody's business but my own. So here we see the dark side of personal independence. She's asserting her independence, but in a manner that allows her to stay in this very destructive relationship. Ethel Waters and Ma Rainey, as, we've already, well, as we saw with Ma Rainey in uh, Prove It On Me Blues, but Ethel Waters and Ma Rainey would openly sing of their lesbianism and of the, the uh, what's the right word for it, the superiority of homosexuality over heterosexuality. So we have women singing openly about violence, both to them and against men. We have women openly singing about their sexual desires as well as sexual violence. We have women openly singing about drinking, committing infidelity, suffering infidelity. And we have women openly singing about lesbianism here. So blues women in these songs were depicting human life and human culture in ways that were as fully modern as anything jazz artists were doing. This was not the orderly, genteel, chaste universe of 19th century music. This was, again, unpredictable, violent, turbulent human life of the 20th century. So as black women, they were denied gentility the gentility that was available to white women as a result of American racism. That is, black women were inherently devalued. But rather than lament their exile from respectability, 
In other words, these aren't songs where these black women are trying to be respectable. Instead, these women blues singers are embracing their marginal status. They're accepting reality, no matter how ugly or distasteful that reality may be. And so what they're doing is they're sketching out tentative moral standards. They're sketching out the ambiguities of modern life. And they're sketching out a way of conducting their life that seems far more appropriate, more, far more apt than the moral code that was clung to by their predecessors or that was still being advocated by some Americans during the 1920s. So these black women blues singers and their white counterparts to a lesser degree were contributing along with jazz musicians and as we'll see George Gershwin to a modern culture that was far more inclusive of people who had previously been marginalized as beyond the bounds of respectability. And as I've said, they're laying out, they're staking out not only the youth culture of the 20th century, but also much of the moral culture of the 20th century. So we'll stop there, talk about George Gershwin next class, and then we'll talk about swing and the apex, the zenith of American jazz.